Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by in-house faculty. Very rigorous research on different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India and Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank, and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, I welcome you all to today's webinar on Indian migrants in the Gulf coping with the double blow of oil price collapse and COVID-19. We are very happy to be doing this webinar in partnership with the Center for Public Policy Research, Kochi. We are delighted to have with us Ambassador Navdeep Suri, who would be chairing and moderating today's session. Ambassador Suri is currently a distinguished fellow and director of the Center for New Economic Diplomacy at the Observer Research Foundation. He has served as country's High Commissioner to Australia and Ambassador to Egypt and the UAE. Also, we have a very select set of panelists for today's program. We have Professor Irdaya Rajan, country's leading expert on migration, who is based in Center for Development Studies, Tiruvanantapuram. We have uh, Dr. D. Dhanuraj, the founder chairperson of CPPR based in Kochi. We have with us Dr. Bindu Lakshmi Patadat, who is associate professor at the Advanced Center for Women's Studies at Tata, Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Before I give floor to Ambassador Suri, let me quickly tell our attendees that you can ask questions by logging into chat as guest option at the bottom of the page in front of you. Type in your name and accept the terms and, terms and conditions and you can begin typing your questions. May I now request Ambassador Suri to kindly conduct the proceedings, sir. Thank you, Deepika, and uh, a warm welcome to the panelists on this very special session. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, in this position of trying to chair it and moderate it. Uh, my only claim to fame uh, uh, for this is the fact that uh, until last September, I was India's ambassador to UAE. And uh, that's an interesting country when you talk about migrants, uh, Indian migrants in the Gulf. And because um, of the roughly 8.9 million or 9 million uh, Indians who are uh, residing in the Gulf, 3.42 million are now in UAE. Um, the International Organization of Migration, um, in its 2018 report, described the India-UAE migration corridor as the world's second busiest after the Mexico-US uh, corridor. And I used to joke with my Emirati friends uh, that uh, uh, in the case of Mexico-US, uh, President Trump wants to build a wall. Uh, but in the case of India-UAE, if there's one demand, then that is for more flights and more connectivity and more bridges between the two countries. Um, the, um, when, when you look at the uh, macro picture for the Indian migrants in the Gulf, um, of the roughly $89 billion that we, $80 billion that we got in remittances last year, um, about half come from the Gulf, uh, of which um, almost $19 billion came from UAE alone. Uh, and when you look at it, that if one person is, uh, one person's remittances are supporting and uh, on an average a family of four or five, uh, you can really see the impact that it makes uh, on the ground. And, you know, all you need to do is visit Kerala and, uh, and, and, and see uh, the, the impact of uh, migrant remittances uh, from the Gulf in particular. Um, I should say that um, for me, uh, being in UAE was really also getting to know Kerala much better because, uh, you know, uh, being from uh, the northern part of the country, it's sometimes uh, uh, easy to not get to know other parts of the country as well. Um, and uh, so my own uh, uh, respect for uh, the manner in which the state of Kerala uh, looks at the whole issue of its migrants um, uh, grew enormously. Uh, during the course of my interactions, uh, both with uh, Government of Kerala officials uh, and also with the uh, community organizations who are incredibly well organized uh, and uh, really passionate about doing whatever they can to serve the community. So, um, you know, when everybody's applauding Kerala's um, success in handling the COVID-19 issue, um, I keep saying and, and, and also when we were preparing and I was talking to some of my colleagues in Ministry of External Affairs about um, the upcoming exodus of migrants from the Gulf, I was saying, please learn from Kerala because they are the best organized when it comes to uh, some of these uh, some of these issues. Um, I just want to say that, you know, there's sometimes an, uh, a tendency to 
conflate migrants only with workers, blue collar workers, and that is not the case. Um, so while our estimates are that of the 9 million odd Indians in the Gulf, uh, perhaps as many as 70% um, might be blue collar. But the fact is that in UAE alone, you also have 33 Indian billionaires, uh, dollar billionaires, uh, and uh, hundreds of multimillionaires, uh, and an entire professional class of bankers and uh, uh, senior management uh, professionals um, who are integral to the uh, success of that country. So uh, when we look at migrants, broadly speaking, I think it's important to look at all of that. Um, and on the specific theme of today, which is the double whammy of the uh, lower oil prices and uh, the uh, COVID-19, um, I think it's important to recognize that that impact, while obviously, as we are seeing in India itself, is most acutely felt by those at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, but the upper parts of the pyramid are also affected by it. Um, you know, there's a strong expectation that there will be business failures. Um, the laws dealing with bankruptcy in some of these countries are pretty um, fragile. Uh, and, and, and so uh, that adds to the pain. And, and, and each time an Indian business goes down, many hundreds of workers lose their jobs with that. Uh, uh, so, so it's all part of that uh, that, that uh, uh, equation. Um, from our side, uh, you know, I just want to add one last point uh, before handing it over to the panelists, uh, which is that um, I think Mrs. Sushma Suraj uh, probably should get credit for her single-minded focus on how do embassies look after our migrants uh, in the uh, Gulf in particular and in other parts of the world um, to create a culture of empathy uh, towards our, uh, our uh, blue collar workers uh, and put in place systems that enable embassies to respond more effectively in situations like the ones that you're finding yourself in today. Um, and uh, uh, among various things that we did, uh, one was the whole e-migrate project, which uh, tries to create a regulated channel of uh, migration to the Gulf countries uh, for our blue collar workers uh, to see whether it can be integrated with the labor portals of UAE or Saudi Arabia. And a lot of work has been done on this. The other, uh, to me, uh, something that I spent almost two years on and we put a lot of effort into it uh, was a, a program to map skills and harmonize skills. Uh, so we did the world's first uh, skill mapping project between a labor source country like India and a labor recipient country like UAE. And um, we identified 16 uh, vocations where our skills could be mapped to UAE requirements and the certificates issued by our institutions are acceptable to UAE authorities so that there's some kind of a premium that our workers get when they go with certain amount of experience and skills and a certificate rather than enter the workforce at the bottom of the uh, value chain. Uh, and, and I'm very happy that the first pilot project has been done successfully and now Saudi Arabia has also come on board on that. And the reason I'm saying this is that a suggestion that I made to government uh, uh, about a month back was that because we were expecting this exodus from the uh, Gulf, uh, I suggested that can we um, also look at the skill profiles of those who are coming back uh, and create a central portal for uh, them uh, in government, which can be accessed by employers around the country. Uh, because some of the people who are coming back have skills that are in short supply in the country. And particularly at a time when everybody in industry is complaining that migrant workers have gone back to their uh, homes and villages, can this provide you a, 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 some kind of a cushion and also mitigate the pain of those coming back uh, from, uh, from the uh, Gulf? Um, just in terms of numbers, uh, as of um, earlier this week, 300,000 plus had registered to come back to India. Um, don't know how accurate that number is, uh, whether it's going to be more or less, 
because the registrations are still growing, but also some people who are registered are not showing up. But I'll share with you that a real problem that our colleagues are facing today uh, is not at that end uh, in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Sharjah or uh, Muscat or Doha. Uh, it's when they come back here. And that's because of the attitude that some of our state governments are taking uh, on the quarantine procedures. It is just think about it. When we look at Indians wanting to come back, we don't segregate them by state. Uh, so if a flight is coming back to uh, Kunur or uh, uh, Calicut, it could also be carrying people for Tamil Nadu, uh, whose destination is Tamil Nadu. And that's where states are making it really difficult for us. Uh, they don't want to take people from other states uh, for quarantine, etc. So there are real practical issues that we are facing. There are some companies who have large number of employees, three, four, five thousand employees each who want to come back. And they say, we'll charter the flights to bring them back. But then if you charter the flights, they have the flight that flight has to come to one location. It could be Delhi, it could be Mumbai, or it could be Trivandrum, it could be uh, Chennai, it could be Bhopal or anywhere. Uh, but you can't expect that charter flight to disaggregate people according to state. Uh, and, and that again is a challenge that we are uh, facing as we uh, deal with this. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, leave those few opening uh, remarks uh, with uh, our wonderful panelists. And without further ado, hand over to Professor Rajan who, as Deepika mentioned, is probably one of our leading authorities on the issue of migration. Professor Ajahn. Uh, thanks, Ambassador Furi. Um, let, me, let me start with, uh, as who started with some numbers. Uh, the Ministry of External Affairs talks about something like uh, 9 million people in the Gulf, if you quoted it. But I think we are underestimating their numbers. I think I would put probably 10 million because I have done survey in both Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Kerala has 2.3 million people in the Gulf and Tamil Nadu has 1.2. So you have 35 lakhs from only two states. So you can imagine people going from other states like uh, uh, what is called uh, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Telangana. So there are many other states which are also sending them. So we have to talk about something like 10 lakh migrants we are talking about, not 10 million migrants. And the second point I want to make at this point is that out of the 83 billion came last year, Gulf almost sends 56 percent of the remittances. That means we are talking something like 10 million people sending half of the remittances to the India. I think this is the number we are talking about. That's why the webinar when we talk about Gulf migration, I think it's an important, uh, you know, a point of discussing these people. Now, there are two more points we should talk. One is that how many are likely to come? I think that is the biggest question everybody is asking. You know, of course, I, I have been asked every day who, how many people will come. But I think uh, what is going to happen now, right now, we have no f regular flights. Only we have only the flights which are... Uh, you know, the, flight, the Indian government is sending the flight. So I told them, we are seeing only the trailer of the movie. The full movie of return migration, you have to wait maybe until September, October. We are only seeing that at least uh, some flights are coming in. But please remember, NARCA has asked the Kerala people to register who want to come. And the data clearly indicate we are going, we are expecting between 10 to 20 percent of the Indians from the Gulf will return. Because out of the 4 lakh people registered in Kerala, 60,000 people said they have lost jobs. So you have a, a, a category called lost jobs. So 60,000 people for 4 lakh. And you put that number to the whole, uh, in the whole India, we are talking about something between 10 to 20 lakhs. And Kerala itself will get 3 lakhs. We are predicting Kerala Gaunti, it is going to be 6 lakhs, but I am begging with them, no, 6 lakhs will not come because even if they come, what they will do? So it's not just to coming down. They will, you know, there is nothing we have ready to offer for them. We have no, uh, you know, like we, we are not going to welcome them. Please come, we have a job, please take over. We have already job crisis. We already have demographic dividend. So, you know, it's something which we have to think about that. So 10 to 20 percent people are likely to come. Now, you have rightly said, you cannot put them in one basket. You cannot put all the returned migrants into one basket. I think this is where we have to talk about policies, program, 
financial packages you know we cannot put them i cannot put all the 10 to 15 million lakhs people coming all need some money all need some loans i am telling to the kerala finance minister no need so you have to diversify this uh, this uh, the, 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 what is called the 20 lakhs or uh, take the example of kerala we are talking about 3 lakhs now please remember i have studied the global crisis in 2008 i have studied the nidagat crisis i have also studied little bit on the kuwait war if you look at that most of the migrants who come back they do re migrate so when you talk about return migration there is some people will re migrate i think we should talk about how to you know package them and send them back because the re migration is part of the return migration for example today even pre covid we had close to 15 tax people are 15 lakh are already here return migration is a phenomena to gulf if you go to gulf you have to return i think that is the uh, that is the rule of the law they don't become pr they don't become green card they don't even get blue card like hero so they have to come back so when they have to come back we have already 15 lakhs malayalis are already back in kerala in fact i have we have six mlas in the assembly who are return migrants i met them separately they belong to different political parties when i told one of the mla he told me these are the six people who won the election contestant will be many more because anyone return making can contest the election they have a, they have a vote bank but so we have to do at least 30% of them will go back it will be true in telangana it will be true in uttar pradesh what we have to do we have to provide them what i call them you have to upgrade their skills india has a huge project called skill india so we have to use this opportunity to, to return migrants who are coming back we have to connect with the skill india program so we have to retrain them we have to give them multiple skills so that at least 30% of the return migrants re migrate i think this is something to be one of the basic policy of the uh, return migration rehabilitation reintegration re migration i think this is one policy suggestion we should discuss more we should talk more and we should talk to the indian government state government please connect this return migrant with skill india program so that they can re migrate the second group of return migrant which are very important today i heard even our prime minister of india talking about package for migrants everybody talking about migrant covid 19 brought the migrant to the limelight otherwise we were talking only remittances first time we are talking about migrants otherwise we never talk about them we only talk about money 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 but the migrants we are talking about i think that is what the covid did for all of us internal migrants international migrants so second part of the people which i think which i have seen in kerala for the last 20 years is some people who are coming at the time of covid or what i call them eventual return that means they went to gulf they made some money they want to return maybe next year they are postponing so they are coming back because of the covid fear and that will be something like 30% that's that we call them eventual return migrants today or tomorrow they have decided to come back they have earned some money now please remember these people have some money they are not looking for anything from the government they have something like 5 lakhs 10 lakhs saving over the last 8 9 years in the gulf even the uh, you know low income low uh, skilled workers but what the problem is that they don't have any viable project to invest they all put the money in the bank and the, you know the bank interest is very low because after return they may live another 15 20 year so we have to advise them to invest the money in a good proposals so the government both private and public should come and advise them put your money in a proper place so that you can remaining your years of life you can be self employed you can do some type of activity like a, maybe the girls uh, area or the you know tax you know waving we should think of some program for them but they don't need financial support they have already some money they saved while they were working in the gulf this is the second group of people for them indian government and state government only to facilitate them they return they need facilitation nothing more but the third group of people where we have to really talk about rehabilitation is the post return migrants according to the survey done by us saying that every time 25 to 30 percent of return migrants who are coming to india are they are not getting their visa extension they are losing jobs that means 
all migrants go with a dream and they are not fulfilling their dream they are coming back without fulfilling they are called the forced return migrants for them we have to talk about how to rehabilitate them and one of the thing kerala government is talking about i think indian government also should discuss about that with the support of the central and state government we should discuss policies and programs for return migrants it can be a one time payment because people are not able to pay money even to come back because they have lost everything so we should talk about financial transfers to talk about soft loans we should again talk about giving them skills so that they can be employed because there will be lot of mobility within the states for example some of the interstate migrant who are in the who are in kerala they may even leave so there may be a availability of jobs in kerala is the kerala return is ready to take those jobs available in in kerala i think this is something we should look at it professor rajan just final two, point people two i, I completely yeah, yeah 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 third and final point which i want to make it when we are talking about return migration today we have to include two important points one is the return migration is happening because of the covid 19 because of the localization policy in the gulf third is the oil price oil price down and then fourth which is the new factor is coming in amnesty please remember kuwait has announced already amnesty i am sure next within 6 month all countries will announce amnesty because i have seen many people in the gulf i told them why can't you come you have no paper they will say i will go next amnesty because of the covid 19 we will get additional return migrants because they have no paper and they cannot stay there because if they want any medical emergency ambassador suri should probably will be telling us if somebody going to the hospital without a proper document he will not be allowed to get into the hospital i have seen in some of the places so they will come because of the fear undocumented migrants i will put at least 10% of the indians are undocumented if the amnesty is announced they will come so we should keep the additional factor which is not talk by everyone and it is true with uh, women it is true with men unskilled semi skilled even engineers who are over saying that i have seen them i met one of the family he said i am un- i am undocumented my wife and my children so we have families of undocumented i think they will come now we have to help them out because they are holding indian passport and we should help them in the time of trouble i will stop here and let us look for some questions and some discussion later thank you ambassador bori thank thank you thank you professor rajan some very very useful uh, points uh, that you've made um you know i'll just uh, comment that uh, uh, uae had its uh, um, big amnesty uh, about a year and a half back um and we were actually uh, surprised that not many people uh, showed up and the reason for that uh, as compared to pakistanis and bangladeshis for example Uh, and the reason for that as we were uh, given to understand including by emirates was because we have had systems in place to enable the repatriation of uh, uh, people who are undocumented and who have lost jobs and so on the fact that we are able to buy a ticket and to give them a subsistence and send them back through our indian community welfare funds uh, means that we've got a running pipeline as opposed to other countries uh, and the saudis of course had a uh, Uh, their uh, uh, amnesty scheme a, a couple of years back and that led to a return of a very sizable number from saudi arabia as well so kuwait hadn't done and so certainly kuwait is a case in point and oman might be as well i think uh, as the countries of concern uh, but let me uh, uh, hand over to dr dhanraj uh, who is chairman of the center for public policy research in uh, kochi Uh, thank you ambassador sudi and thank you icwo for uh, giving me this opportunity and also giving an opportunity for cppr to partner in this webinar uh my studies uh, more or less my academic uh, uh, and policy studies are related to the political economy and most of my polit- political economy studies in kerala uh, um, most of the papers i done with kerala in the kerala context eventually uh, led to the migration connect uh, so what i'm going to discuss is how the migration is going to influence and impact kerala's economy and political economy especially uh, i think we should not forget i i, I think uh, dr rajan has given a very a very interesting introduction in fact i start with that 
around 3 million population migrants uh, especially in, um, in, in, in in gulf countries and the remittance that we were receiving for the last so many years it was on a uh, you know uh, it was uh, it was growing all these years but now it shows some decline in the last few years so from some 13000 crores in 20 uh, i would say 1996 uh, when we had around uh, 1.4 uh, 14 lakh uh, migrants there in Gulf. Today we have around 3 million and we're getting around 70,000 70, crores. In fact, at one point of time, we had touched even uh, 80,000 crores. So, looking at uh, Kerala's uh, GSTP, we have got uh, around 6,50,000 lakh, lakh crores. Uh, 6 lakh 50, crores. And uh, it looks, it comes to me around, uh, uh, if, you, if you do a ball uh, park figures, uh, it comes to around one, one sixth of the money of the SDP is coming from the remittance. I mean, it is accounted by the remittance. And if you look at the per capita income of every Malayali, uh, uh, and if you calculate the per capita remittance of Mal uh, every family, I think uh, the per capita income and the per capita remittance is almost same. So that is, you are doubling up the per capita uh, nature in the, in the state. But more importantly, I think uh, we should discuss uh, not only about those six MLAs, I think we, we have a, uh, a long history, I mean, uh, uh, of uh, various institutions, various uh, uh, processes that are evolved because of the migration in this, from the state. I'll just give you a couple of examples. You know, if you look at uh, health or if you look at education, uh, I see there is a huge influence of the remittance in Kerala. Uh, uh, the kind of system that we are operating today, everybody acknowledges Kerala's uh, you know, public health care system as well as the education system. I think we should not forget that there are also institutions. It's not only about government run institutions, it's also government aided institutions uh, which are managed and owned by private individuals. And uh, if you look at the, the, the background of these institutions, the reasons why they set up the institution, the reasons, the various factors that influence uh, these individuals to set up these institutions, I see remittance as a major reason. Which is what happened in 80s and 90s, my reading, as well, uh, my, for my reading, what I understand is, uh, uh, the, the, when migrants, uh, people started leaving Kerala in 80s and early 90s, the first thing they've done was they started, uh, you know, building their houses. Uh, they started, uh, you know, acquiring some properties. You know, they invested in land, they invested in houses. Then they invested in, uh, let's say, VCRs and tape recorders of that time. Then later they invest in two wheelers. Then finally, uh, uh, like Dr. Rajan said, there was no other avenue for them to use. And uh, because of the high regulatory uh, the, the migrants were reluctant to uh, put money in government projects or various other investment projects. Uh, of course, Kerala is known for investment uh, at that time. So what they've done is uh, the money that they saved in their, you know, the accounts, they used to spend for the relatives and kids and kids back in home here in Kerala. They started setting up, uh, you know, shopping complexes, for example, or uh, mini malls in Kerala. Uh, and uh, this actually uh, eventually, eventually uh, uh, led to the urban development. Dr. Dhanaraj, any, any points on the returning migrants now? Because that's the theme and uh, we're right, running short of time. That. So yeah. the point but quickly, is because we're running short of time. The urban, the urban continuum that we have seen is because of remittance. And now when the remittance is drying, then I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, scared of you know, what is going to happen to the Kerala economy as such. Because the institutions here in Kerala is more or less best supported and complemented by the remittance money in all these years. Whether it is religious institutions, whether it is a cultural organizations, even the philanthropy, even Chief Minister of Kerala announcing you know, this many people have donated this, many, this much amount of money to the Kerala Chief Minister's Fund. But my understanding is if you analyze it, the liquidity in the market was more or less enhanced by the migrants. You know, those who were uh, there and they were sending this money to Kerala and the relatives were, you know, using uh, in a very creative manner in Kerala to, you know, establish various institutions and providing liquidity in the market. The other one I would... Uh, you know, the, how this is going to impact uh, the, the political economy. I would even say the institutions I started with, you know, uh, 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 because in the political economy, various institutions, I talked about health, I talked about education. I'll just give one example. 
we have more than 150 private engineering colleges in kerala which has got something called nri quota the nri quota is they are taking a, 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 probably a, 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 a bigger amount of money from the nri students coming here so what is going to happen to you know those institutions now once the nri quota the money is not there so that is going to indirectly lead to the loss of jobs for the teachers and also probably some of the institutions will find it difficult to sustain now so same is the case with our uh, you know health economy there are a lot of people coming to kerala uh, as a health uh, tourism is uh, one of the promising sectors we have and because of the connection that we have there you know even the emirates are coming to kerala because they connect there so now that connection is we are going to lose and then again that sector is going to also going to be affected then uh, 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 i would uh, 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 the, the construction work you know I'm just picking few ideas the construction sector in kerala you know it's one of the major contributors to the kerala state gst why construction was happening because the money that was coming from kerala uh, because the money was uh, you, know, you save the money and then you construct uh, various buildings different types of buildings and rent it and lease it to the different uh, people so uh, all together i see uh, uh, we we have a problem now because uh, uh, blue collar job we talked about blue collar job and white collar job i think 70 to 70% of people who are coming to kerala they are uh, they are like blue collar job unlike you know people who may come from united states or united kingdom so there i see a problem in in terms of what is the ease of doing business for them because whatever we are discussing even by the kerala government so far is about the administrative you know from the, uh, the the administrative intervention you know we can bring them back we can quarantine them then uh, like dr rajan said you know we can give some them some amount of money so that they can start a business there but we are not discussing the reason the fundamental reason why these people left kerala in 90s and early 2000s because this state was not producing enough number of job opportunities for them so now coming back i don't see anything has changed dramatic significant change is not there in kerala's political landscape in the last 20 years to ensure that those who are coming back who could actually set up entrepreneurial uh, activities or those who are setting up entrepreneurial activities could absorb those skilled or semi skilled labor who are coming back from gulf countries so i see we need the economic action more than the administrative action now because administrative action we have been experiencing for the last 15 years but the economic action is absent today and if we are not we are not addressing that part i think we have a huge problem we are going to face that Thank you so much. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zanaraj. In fact, uh, you know your points on the uh, economy and the political economy of the whole migrants uh, sector. Um, when um, when I was in Abu Dhabi and we used to do these uh, counselling camps regularly at uh, the uh, various workers' villages, um, one of the things that we had incorporated into the menu of uh, uh, the counselling camps uh, uh, was on financial literacy. Uh, and uh, uh, encouraging the workers to start saving up some money because uh, oh, you had enough stories in Kerala and in elsewhere of all of the savings being spent on a house or on a wedding or something. And, and when uh, there's a family emergency or something happens, there's nothing in the kitty left. Uh, so it, it is part of our, uh, our, our regular interaction. Um, and, and a thought that I have, which I will leave for the uh, for the panelists to come back later, uh, is we also saw the images of large number of migrants from other parts of the country leaving or wanting to leave Kerala. Uh, do you see some of those jobs being taken up by returning migrants from Kerala or would these, those jobs be seen as beneath the uh, dignity and stature of the uh, returning migrants, but we can come to that uh, later. So uh, let me go to Professor uh, Dr. Bindu Lakshmi, who is Associate uh, Professor at the Advanced Center for Women's Studies at TIS in Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Suri, for this opportunity. Uh, in fact, uh, what I want to flag here, we are going through an extraordinary times, perhaps uh, you know, this kind of world which we never imagined. Uh, however, uh, what the humanitarian crisis, what we face today, I don't necessarily think it is only the impact of global pandemic or is it uh, the effect of the larger policies of the nation states with apathy and indifference. That's what which I feel the, the migrant crisis which is uh, you know, rolling over us, which we see today. 
In that sense, COVID-19 is not only a global health crisis, rather it brings out inequalities around the world much more starkly. These crises are not new. It has always been there. We have talked about it abundantly in academic discussions, asked policymakers and concerned governments to pay attention to it. Perhaps COVID-19 is giving us one more opportunity to make it much more emphatic. The panelist before me already addressed some of the issues of return migration. However, I am not going to flag all the all that issues. I want to very specifically flag only a few issues, particularly the gender impact, gendered impact of COVID-19 in Gulf migration. As we know, the impact of COVID-19 is disproportionate. One of the most marginalized among migrants in the Gulf are the domestic workers. I'm trying to bring in some of my own work. I have done an uh, intensive ethnography field work among the undocumented migrant domestic workers in UAE. Many of these workers are in precarious living conditions, live within the households of their employers as living domestics or as live outs in cramped bed spaces. COVID-19 lockdowns have uh, brought down extra burden to many of these women workers as it is the case with many women care workers across the globe, which we know of how care work uh, it disproportionately uh, the burden comes to women. And particularly when we talk about the migrant domestic workers, the burden is much more. One perhaps need to read it along with the stories of gendered violence coming from various parts of the world during lockdown situation. Like many other marginalized workers in the Gulf, domestic workers face unpaid wages forced labor, dangerous working conditions. The contexts are specific here as they do not come under the labor law as well. As I already mentioned, impact of COVID-19 is not the same for all. It is important at this extraordinary time to emphatically articulate some of the non-negotiables for the workers, particularly workers who are in marginal positions. For example, many domestic workers in the Gulf are undocumented. As I told, it, uh, told already, many of uh, my own work among domestic workers talk about this uh, precarious conditions of undocumentation. The conditions of undocumentation is not designed by the migrants themselves. Rather, undocumented or irregular conditions are created through the fault lines of our policies. Many undocumented domestics in the Gulf work as part-timers in many houses, COVID-19 definitely will throw open multiple health risks to these workers as many stay in cramped accommodation. I know that many of them who stay in uh, knife area and various other parts in Dubai know that what kind of living accommodation, the kind of bed spaces where live out domestic workers are you know, uh, staying. Many of them must have lost their jobs by now. One of the, one, on the one hand, uh, women uh, have to fa uh, face this extra burden of care responsibilities as an outcome of lockdown. On the other hand, they are also facing problems of living conditions. Adequate living condition is a fundamental rights of the marginal workers. I want to emphasize that it is not the demand only for these extraordinary times. It should be a normative demand, ensuring fair uh, pay for the workers who have lost their jobs or who are working overtime at this crisis situation should be emphasized. How do we make sure when many domestics are under the mercy of their employees? Often it becomes difficult for workers to negotiate with their employees. And I know, uh, Ambassador Suri, you yourself uh, know of the situation, so Kafala system. Kafala system of employment makes some of these situations much more difficult and precarious. It bounds the workers in a bonded labor situation. It is time to think about many of these discriminatory practices. Perhaps, I want to emphasize this, COVID-19 is perhaps taking these discriminatory practices and make steps to systematically remove it. It is uh, commendable that UAE has introduced amnesty for irregular undocumented workers during this time, which uh, UAE anyway has been doing for many, many years. However, how do we make sure that workers are not stranded if there are no means of uh, traveling back? For example, the celebrated evacuation plan of Indian government doesn't necessarily help all workers. The kind of stories I've been trying to follow up with the people who are already stranded in UAE. I've been making telephonic conversations with people. So uh, let me perhaps put it on record, my skepticism with the mission Vande Bharat. Uh, other than invoking symbolic nationalist sentiment, I am not sure whether it is really ensuring enabling conditions for those most marginalized 
perhaps it is high time to move beyond the symbolic nationalist sentiments and make our priorities much more clear make enabling conditions for the most marginalized for example i was thinking about indian community welfare fund this again the conversation which i have been having for last uh, couple of weeks with uh, migrants who are already in the gulf uh, i see uh, wf fund should be adequately and transparently utilized for those in distress stranded workers should be able to access health care food and financial support using many of these avenues it is important that india together with gulf states to ensure these enabling situations for the workers at this time of crisis and it is very important to ensure that workers are brought in safe irrespective of the legal status i want to bring in this idea of legal status much more clearly because this is one of the area of research i have been engaging for last uh, several years as the lives of many undocumented domestics reveal the conditions of illegality is created through a system of precarity can we really blame the workers for the legal status or do we need to think about the conditions such as kafala system and others which make the uh, condition illegal since 2004 onwards uh, i'm trying to bring a very small example for how this conditions of precariousness come in since 2004 onwards we know india government has banned women below 30 years of age if they belong to ecr category this uh, situation has created precariousness as many women have traveled to the gulf states as domestics without proper channel that's what happens at one level there is a protectionism comes from the state and then there is no way women can travel they are trying to travel through other uh, channels of migration which uh, one may call as illegal channels so these are the conditions of precarity another issue which i want to flag here is conditions of workers particularly those in confinement again the lives of migrant domestic workers could be a case in point here as we hear from other parts of the world as well detainees and those in confinement face greater vulnerabilities and uh, let us not forget women in shelter homes in the gulf and then i am again uh, you know recollecting many of my experiences as women who stranded there when world economy shrinks the effect is disproportionately felt on those who are most marginalized covid-19 pandemic is informing us to think about socially sensitive policies and reimagine an inclusive world women migrant wor workers constitute 41.6 percentage of migrant workforce globally and when it comes to gulf migration uh, the context of the gulf the percentage is almost the same around 41.6 uh, around that this is again i'm uh, trying to take ilo statistics many of them are health care workers we know that women nurses traveling to the gulf and care workers and most of them are women so there is again a disproportionate uh, gender and uh, labor uh, here we could see exposure to any health crisis is multifold in this context many of them face unemployment at this moment of crisis as well we need to have a much any final points dr lakshmi into one more point we need to have much more research data on the impact on some of these gendered fallouts of covid pandemic uh while we are worried about oil price in covid pandemic let us also remember fallouts are not the same for all a more intersectional approach to look at migrants lives is need of this hour and we cannot distinguish between documented and undocumented workers at this moment of crisis and need to you know or deal with the, the um we've taken the matter up at the level of the ministers you know uh, to say that because it's a serious problem it's a human rights problem it should be treated as human trafficking and not just as a labor issue uh, because the redressal mechanisms in the two cases are Uh, are, are different we've taken it up with police authorities in uh, places like ajman which have been hot, hot beds of uh, the the racket uh, that is run but let us also not um, close our eyes to the fact that at both ends of the racket in india and in the gulf it is indians who are involved uh, it is a profit motive which which is involved let us not disregard the fact that it is local agents in say east godavari district who are catching hold of desperate women and promising them a dream that doesn't exist uh, the immigration officer at the hyderabad airport counter who knows that this person is on the ecr list and still looks the other way because of some private arrangement that may have been worked out um, what we have been trying to do is document cases make short videos which are like testimonials from the individuals concerned who have been rescued to send the message back to their uh, villages that this is not 
the uh, bed of roses that has been promised to you. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's something that I'm very passionate about, but I can assure you that from our embassy and our consulate, we've done a, a lot. Uh, but the problems are systemic and we can't fix the laws of the other country. Uh, that uh, So long as the poverty creates such a supply of desperation, uh, people continue to try and want to go. Uh, but let me hand it over uh, to our host, uh, Dr. Deepika, now for her comments. Thank you, sir. Uh, one thing that comes out very significantly from this uh, economic um, health crisis is that the segmented nature of the labor market in GCC states. Now, while most of the Gulf states have announced massive stimulus packages supporting these small and medium businesses by postponing various taxes, exempting uh, these businesses from government levies and fees, and even covering the salaries of all private sector employees, we see that the foreign migrants have been, who've been disproportionately hit by the pandemic, they've been left out by authorities as well as the employers. UAE, which receives the highest number of Indian migrants in the region, has changed its laws to allow company, to allow companies to break the work contract of non-nationals, restructure their contracts to lower salaries, and pressurize these workers to take unpaid leaves. Until recently, the immigration and gender policies pursued in these GCC states have resulted in a very highly segmented labor market where high paid protected jobs are taken by nationals and they result in a public sector plagued by overstaffing and low productivity. And there is an avoidance of low paid private sectors by nationals. So we see a, a private sector which is dominated by immigrants. These policies have also resulted uh, in distortion of education system, which fails to prepare the youth for joining the, the, the GCC youth for joining workforce or creating a vibrant and competitive private sector. So we see that private sector activity has remained uh, concentrated in low skill, non tradable sectors like construction and uh, services, uh, meeting the consumption and investment demands of the do domestic market. And, and these, these kind of, uh, uh, not very, uh, vibrant private markets, uh, are ill-equipped to absorb the millions of new, uh, labor uh, market entrants who are entering GCC workforce every, every year. So what we see is, uh, that demographic pressures of a growing youth and female work population and shrinking oil revenue and slower economic growth that has been, uh, there since 2014, and, and also the leadership transitions that are happening in many of these states is leading to uh, uh, these transformation, national transformation plans where efforts are being made to uh, transform these economies from a rentier economy to uh, a knowledge-based economy. Now, it's important to see what kind of uh, implications these uh, national transformation plans or Vision 2030, as they are called, will have on, on the uh, migrant workers. The goal of these plans remains to uh, contribute to a more nationalized and productive private sector, which can employ the restive and increasingly vocal young, and, uh, young men and women uh, by offering them greater economic opportunities and ultimately rewriting the social contract, which has been based on distribution of oil wealth. To in investment in education, in innovative technology and skill training, these plans seek to increase the employability of nationals and encourage a culture of entrepreneurship, especially promote uh, small and medium enterprises that can take advantage of an of a economy open to both domestic and foreign competition. So we see uh, policies like Nitakat uh, since 2009 have aimed at Saudiization of labor markets, where quotas imposed for, imposed for hiring and training of Saudi nationals are matched by subsidies while work permit fees are increased for recruiting migrant workers. In short run, the imperative of mitigating the fallout from this dual crisis uh, will result in reversal of certain subsidy cuts and uh, hiking utility, utility fees uh, to help these small and medium uh, enterprises cope up. But in the medium to long run, we are likely 
to see the continuation and even acceleration of trend away from policies of zero income taxes for citizens and expats. Uh, so what we are looking at is a shrinking of public sector as these states look to uh, reduce dependence on uh, dependence of the state on oil revenues and the economic dependence of citizens on state. So we see these, these programs will be implemented uh, with greater urgency, which will have some implications for migrant workers. But we also uh, have to understand that Gulf's tax-free environments, you know, they've been the major appeal for attracting foreign entrepreneurs and workers. And so, so even the success of these national transformation plans, whether they are downsized or, or, or continue on the same trajectory, will depend on attracting talent and capital from across the world. So the challenge for G GCC states is going to be how to promote the employment of nationals without imposing undue cost of doing business that would erode the competitive competitiveness and, uh, poten and potentially reduce growth. Uh, another uh, important point to remember is that while there is an increasing push for nationalization of labor markets, but in these, many of these GCC states, uh, we see that the regimes uh, actually prefer these mega projects, which are designed to enhance a country's prestige and soft power, rather than directly benefiting citizens, such as UAE's uh, Expo 2020, which has been postponed to next year, Qatar's uh, World Cup 20, 2022, or the much-wanted uh, futuristic economic cities on the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia. So these mega projects and coupled with uh, growing uh, infrastructure and service needs of a growing uh, GCT population means that the demand for low and semi-skilled workers is going to remain high. Uh, and, and we'll see that they, they would be increasing, uh, they would be continuing demands for domestic workers and care, uh, care, care workers and healthcare profes professionals, which is going to remain high in, in the long run. So my point is that uh, while there is this exodus right now uh, because of the government enforced lockdown, there are there are number of uh, migrants, semi skilled and uh, and then unskilled, who are returning uh, to their home countries. But the nature of these Gulf economies is such uh, that uh, you know, despite all these uh, national transformation plans, which are trying to nationalize labor market. Uh, I mean, it's 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 uh, not very hard to see that uh, this whether the mechanization of labor force or or quick training uh, of the national uh, nationals in uh, to replace the foreign migrants is not going to be easy. So this while there may be uh, uh, this this uh, time period when the migrants return to their home countries, in the long run, these pull factors are once again going to draw them back to the Gulf. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Deepika. And I think you make a very interesting point that uh, um, are we looking at um, uh, secular changes taking place rather than just an episode related to uh, COVID-19? Um, and uh, in the context of particularly the Saudiization program, and I mentioned that because uh, um, that's the only place where you have uh, really started uh, seeing uh, Saudi nationals work in retail uh, or at the front desks in hotels or in some other positions that were traditionally seen as beneath the Saudis and, and uh, were largely occupied by expats. In Oman, you've started to see some Omani drivers, taxi drivers, uh, which might have been unimaginable uh, a decade ago. Um, I think there will still be constraints, but uh, uh, to the extent that the revenues are shrinking in these countries, uh, the capacity of these countries to have a public sector that can absorb uh, a, a large and youthful population or a growing and youthful population uh, are going to be limited. Um, in UAE, for example, until, until uh, fairly recently, um, Anybody could get a job in some government department or uh, in some uh, public sector entity, uh, but that's no longer the case. And uh, so the Emiratis are actively encouraging private sector to take uh, Emiratis uh, and, uh, and, and pressure is being put. I think the question will remain that are there going to be enough Emiratis willing to work at the
price point uh, in, in some of the lower occupations. The Saudis are showing that they already are willing to do that in certain cases, uh, but I, I think for others you might have. So you may actually see a shrinkage of the overall pool of expatriate labor uh, in, in, in some of these countries, uh, particularly at the middle level service industry uh, level. Uh, I want to move to the Q&A se uh, segment and I can see that some of the most interesting uh, questions are directed towards Professor Rajan, possibly because his presentation was uh, amongst the most interesting. Professor Rajan, are you able to see the questions? Yeah, I can. I am able to see that. I would like to pick up one or two questions. Please, please go ahead. Uh, just tell us which questions yeah. you are taking. And yeah, I am going to pick up three questions. Basically, one on what I should advise if I am supposed to advise to the government, and second will be on the oil price down, and the third one will be on the uh, internal migrants leaving Kerala. What will happen to the situation? You know. So let me start with the last question first. Uh, uh, one of the thing going to happen in Kerala is that. We are going to get 3 lakh people going to come back. That's what uh, my understanding based on the ARCA data and our own studies uh, based on the last 20 years. But however, COVID has brought a situation where the Northeast migrants and the migrants who are very far away, they are likely to leave. Some of them have left before the COVID. Some of them will leave right now. So please remember that we will have 3 lakh jobs available in Kerala vacated by the interstate migrants. Now the point is that if the return migrants are ready to take those jobs, I think this is some question. I think we should really talk about that. If the, if the, if the Kerala government or any government can do something to see that there is a matching point that they can match because many of the Kerala migrants are doing the same job in the Gulf. They may be getting extra money. Dubai same job. Kerala plumber is in Dubai. We are getting plumber from Orissa. So we can't the Kerala plumber can take the job. I think this is something we should look at it. That means we are talking about respect for work. If the Malayalis want to get a job, there will be jobs available waiting for them. They don't need to worry. But they may not take the jobs. I think that is something we should look at it. The second point I want to talk about this is the oil price uh, low. I am not very, very much worried about the oil price rise because we have seen earlier the oil price has gone to this level and it has gone up to 110 barrel. So we have, we have seen that. Please remember today, India has 45 airports and around 1000 planes are parked. Car is parked, all the buses are parked, all everything is parked in the country today globally. You can't see any plane playing in the throughout the world now. Please remember when everybody started taking their car, bus, everything, there will be a demand for oil. So it is only a short term phenomena within three to six months, probably the oil price will be doubled than what you are talking because oil price is moderated. Please remember oil producing countries, what a pack. They are joining together, they are fixing the price. But we are not, as a sending countries, we are not able to fix the wages for our worker. We are not united. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Sri Lanka, Nepal, we are not united to fix the problem because we are all fighting each other to occupy some market. So I think COVID brought us, if we can unite, sending countries can unite together so that we can solve some of the problem in the Gulf. Now the third point which I want to raise probably what we can do if the return migrants are going to come back. I think yesterday our Prime Minister spoke about 20 lakh crore package for India to overcome the COVID and the stimulate growth. He also mentioned there will be some funds will go from even the PM care fund for migrants. I think we should talk about like they are talking about package for small farmers, package for small industries. We should talk about a big package for internal migrants and international return migrants. I think First time we should talk about a financial package for migrants, standard migrants, countries of origin, it should be worked in the, what is called the repatriate way. Some money should come from the community welfare fund, some, birds, some money should come from the government budget, some money should come from even the chief minister relief fund. I was telling to the Kerala government, don't spend all your CM fund to buy ventilators. You can buy ventilators. Please remember, we don't want our own migrants suffering 
are starving in the house without food so we have equal responsibility to provide social security for the returned migrant i think the first thing should be a financial package second thing people are not happy with skill india because i am getting some comments i can see that till india has not very successful fine but still we can re energize the skill india if we can do that because as i told you earlier even 2008 global crisis people who got multiple skills they were able to hold their jobs in the gulf so we should talk about that and the third point we should also talk about that indian migrants are in 200 plus countries but half of the migrants are in the gulf we should talk about sending our migrant to non gulf why only we are talking about gulf 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 there are 200 countries in the world and there may be new destination might emerge covid will bring you even there may be demand from america because already there are already 1 lakh people died and the europe so we we should not only concentrate on gulf we should think about beyond gulf i think covid has taught us a lesson we should talk about beyond gulf and the government state government migrant associations nrks all should join together think beyond gulf covid has given a good lessons which is think beyond gulf okay. Okay. thank you thank you dr thank you dr um dr dhanraj any, any comment that you want to make um, um i i i you asked this question whether these returning migrants are going to compensate uh, i mean when dr rajan mentioned it i am not so sure about it uh, i mean at least in kerala conditions uh, uh, it is one of, first of all i don't think all the interstate migrants have gone back to the states because they still believe that kerala is the most safest place to a bit i mean to be uh, so uh, part of the migrants have gone back but now the question is what is the attitude of state what is the attitude of the society to those who are coming back from gulf i think that is going to be a crucial uh, that is going to be very very crucial in this particular phase of our territories i i that's what i going back to my earlier statement you know what is the political landscape what is the political economic landscape of the state uh, uh, and also those 70% of the returnees are blue collar jobs uh, blue collar they were in the blue collar jobs so what kind of job we can give them here and how how they are ready willing to uh, be here to, to take those jobs i think there were reasons why they migrated from kerala that's what i'm coming to you know there were reasons why they left kerala in the past and those reasons are still there uh, i don't see those changes here in kerala the only thing that kerala government is doing now is they are saying you know you can register with the norca uh, norca will probably screen orient uh, train and boost the management of those professionals who want to do certain things in kerala i think it's not uh, when first of all there's a fundamental mistake i think we are making i think we can have all these good packages good statements but more than that i think we need uh, the market intervention i think we need market intervention because i think we are not going to get few hundred people here we are going to get 100000 people coming back to kerala i don't think we have the state capacity to absorb all of them even if they absorb it i as a policy researcher i don't agree i don't i do have disagreements with the way uh, you know government could absorb them second point is we have to revive our market there could be demand there could be more entrepreneurial activities there could be more growth for the state and also understand their money was helping us to sustain and survive all these years now the money is not there so it's not about who is going to give them job i mean whether they are going to get the job who is going to give them job that's the question now because those who are giving the job they are they are not going to have the liquidity that they had in the past so i think we have to have a reorientation as the policy of the state government has to be reoriented so that that's what i i come back to the point it's not only the administrative action we need economic action now we need definite we need economic action even uh, the various statements by the officials of the government including the minister chief minister and minister here i don't see any economic action as such they always talk about the protectionism you know you are, you are happy to protect you i am happy with that we have to protect them we have to save them support them but this could be there only for few months after that there is a reality and i am not so sure about how long it will take for our, uh, the 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 oil economy to revive and i i believe that covid also will lead to some other inadvertent consequences globally so that the uh, the, the role played with the global economy the the, uh, the oil economy 
I think the role would be diminished in the coming years. So we have to find different avenues where we could, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, those who are going back to uh, Gulf or elsewhere in the world, they need to find different jobs and different skill sets. It's not only about uh, government uh, training uh, them, uh, the improving or upgrading their skills. It's also the market has to be there. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, 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 but, but I, uh, uh, my last point is. Kerala 65% of the GSTP is coming from service sector and we should not forget it. It's only 11% comes from the agriculture and we have got around 20% comes from the manufacturing sector and we don't have too many manufacturing units in Kerala. We have more or less depending on the service sector. So who is providing job opportunities in service sector? Though this, the providers in the service sector, the money, the money, the liquidity, the market is economic. So we need to Thank find you. a balance mechanism there. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bindalakshmi, there were a couple of questions on the female domestic workers. Uh, one is also addressed to me, which I can take up, but why don't you take a shot at it first? Yeah. So, uh, no, I just want to three, uh, no, very briefly three points to address those questions. One, uh, there is also this question of skilling profile. I want to say that we cannot, uh, no, paint all migrants in one broad brush so that the skilling profile then should be adequately and contextually and case to case because female domestic workers also come up with very specific skills and I don't understand why they are still uh, documented as unskilled workers in the uh, in all uh, documents. So one need to think about that and whether skilling profile women who want to come back, whether we can think about other kind of entrepreneurial activities for them, this is something which we can think about. The other question, there is uh, something about undocumented workers and how do we ensure safety, which I want to again, uh, want to emphasize here, undocumentation, undocument, the conditions of un undocumented worker is not something by their own design. SU also has emphasized that it has come through certain conditions of precarity from both sending countries as well as from the countries where they work. But as I agree with you, Ambassador Suri, we cannot change the law of uh, some other country. However, it is very important for us to look at internally and maybe we can change uh, our own uh, legal uh, positions. I still don't know why women below the age 30 cannot travel as documented workers. It is making them in conditions of precarity. They have to wait for 30 years of their age. Most of the time, most women uh, don't even get, uh, there is a competition in the labor market, particularly women working in you know, domestic uh, spheres. So uh, it is important to make some of those, uh, you know, look at some of our own legal document, make it much more clear that why should women uh, wait until the age of 30. It is uh, one of the reasons here would be uh, we consider women's migration, we always uh, conflate it with trafficking. Migration and uh, trafficking cannot be conflate, conflated. Uh, when we think about women migration, it is not that they are always traveling as vulnerable victims. They also wanted to work and travel as rightful workers. And can we think about it? It has been, you know, it has been a long argument. We want to relax some of these age bans and then we are still you know, holding on this protectionism. And I think this protectionism is coming from very patriarchal attitude of uh, you know, protection statement, which we need to think about. So that's the last point which I wanted to then bring in, uh, look at but uh, again, uh, no, this is uh, none of this uh, is not specifically about uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic specificity. It has been there. These issues have been there, but it has come out much more clearly right now. So let us think about uh, uh, how do we, you know, uh, how do we uh, you know, uh, look at policies uh, which is not specific to COVID-19 pandemic, but some of those issues and uh, no, uh, bringing much more intersectional perspective and think about uh, uh, migration is not one standalone phenomenon of a uh, no, broader group. It is there are definitely gender, class and kind of work which they do that is imp uh, importantly interlink interlinked. So let us have much more. That's why when I'm saying when you're thinking about a socially uh, responsible policy, let us also think about intersectionalities. These migrants are uh, one. So just uh, to uh, conclude one point, thanks for the clarification for ICWF fund, uh, which because you have first hand experience as an ambassador. But I want to also, there are some uh, communication, there are some comments from the uh, participants as well. Uh, the ICWF fund, there are a lot of anxiety among migrants because now government has put up that everybody has to pay from their own pocket. Uh, 
to travel. It's like 15,000 Indian rupees would come roughly, I guess, 1,000 uh, dirham. Not everybody can pay. And uh, no, how do we, can we look at uh, contextually and is there ways of uh, looking at okay. and make it much more transparent? I will stop here. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I've got a lot on my plate, but Dr. Deepka, any, any, any uh, comment that you want to make? Uh, or should I take up some of the questions? Or you can take other questions. Well, I have just one little question. Maybe Please. I could answer it very Please. quickly. Please. So there's a question on uh, what this COVID-19 means for uh, diversification plans uh, in GCC states. Uh, I would say that there is a very strong uh, domestic uh, logic of regime survival to it. The fact that there are uh, millions of young men and women entering labor market and they have to be absorbed so in the in the long run we are going to see that these these uh, states will stick to their uh, policy of uh, developing a more vibrant uh, private sector which is more dominated by the nationals so so we, we we see that short run there might be some reversal with with uh, with, with spend, spending cuts and all that but in the long run uh, this diversification plan will have to be actually accelerated thank you sir Okay, um, you know, um, on Dr. Bindu Lakshmi's point, which I think uh, relates to a lot of people on ICWF, I just want to clarify, the Indian Community Welfare Fund does not come from the government of India. Uh, it is a small charge that we levy on every passport and visa service that we render. Uh, and that money uh, uh, is separately receipted and goes into a separate kitty. Uh, and that fund is audited uh, and that fund is can be used only for specified purposes. And one of the challenges, obviously, for uh, uh, missions is do you use all of that fund on a single episode like an evacuation now? Or is it something that you're going to need day after day after day for distressed workers, for people who've lost their jobs? We give them 40 dirhams a day subsidy in UAE. Uh, we can do that for a period of up to three months. Somebody has died, we have to send the body uh, back to India, the mortal remains back to India. We are able to buy the ticket uh, and, 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 and do that. Somebody uh, has met with an accident, can we pay for the hospitalization expenses? And we, we, we do all of that. Um, so it, it's, it is to be used within certain parameters and the government, uh, when it framed those guidelines, um, determined that an ambassador or consul general, what is the limit within which it can be used by the ambassador or consul general? And beyond that, it needs to go back to government for approval. And again, utilized for certain guide, uh, uh, certain uh, specified uh, purposes. Um, and, 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 and it is enormously helpful for ambassadors, for diplomatic missions to have that. Because remember, 10 years back when we didn't have the fund, we would feel frustrated and handicapped that we know that somebody is in distress, but there's nothing that we can do because we don't have the resources. So today we have those resources and those resources are used very purposefully. And uh, Dr. Bindu Lakshmi, because you made this point two, three times, I want to emphasize it with the same degree of passion. We do not make a distinction between documented and undocumented workers. For us, an Indian is an Indian is an Indian, so long as the passport is in, is Indian. That is the only document that matters uh, to us. We don't look at the state. We don't look at the ethnicity. We don't look at the language. We don't look at any of those. And, and, and sometimes these issues do crop up that, oh, Kerala is getting more attention than Telangana is getting uh, or somebody else. And we say no. To us, uh, when we are overseas, it's it's only the, the passport uh, that, that matters. Um, on, on the issue of, because there's several questions on the, on the female domestic workers, I want to say that, yes, things are difficult, but if I had to look at a trend, then things are getting better rather than worse because the countries themselves realize that there is reputational damage to them uh, if there are too many cases of mistreatment or abuse. Uh, and and, and uh, often, the uh, so so one particular thing that I wanted to correct you on is that until three years back, the broad category of personal staff, which is female domestic workers, cooks, drivers, 
used to come used to fall outside the purview of the ministry of labor and of labor laws but 3 years back those rules were amended and 2 years back now all the domestic staff also come within the remit of labor laws so that's a change that took place at least in uae i i would need to check if it has happened in uh, other countries um the one final point on this uh, uh, which is on uh, the point that you made on skills uh, and i think that's really important because i think we need to look at what a country like philippines has done uh, and and see are we able to copy some of the best practices um philippines uh, and this is not patriarchal it's protective we don't put any restrictions on nurses going for example and as you mentioned there are tens of thousands of indian uh, nurses in the gulf or elsewhere and they do good jobs and they do uh, earn a decent salary and there isn't an issue the most vulnerable category is the female domestic workers and and that's where we uh, we see how we can address uh, their vulnerability uh, their precarious condition what philippines has done is it's put a minimum wage and it's made training mandatory before departure so even if you've got a job offer from uh, a country in the gulf you are not allowed to board the flight unless you can show that you've been skilled and your contract offers you a certain minimum job uh, wage which is i think 600 dollars or something in the case of philippines so that there's a dignified wage available to the person when uh, when they go overseas um are we able to do that i have uh, advocated that this is not rocket science most of our female domestic workers end up in difficulty because they cannot communicate they don't know a word of the language uh they can't operate a, a, a modern appliance because uh, they have come straight from a village or uh, they uh, uh, can't uh, maintain the kind of hygiene uh, that is expected in a, a modern society and so very soon the conflict with the uh with the house owner or somebody uh, begins and the frustrations start including lack of communication but these are easily addressable as part of skill india you could address them and then create jobs you know a, a, a one month program in housekeeping for example would impart many of the skills uh, and the language uh, uh, that you need and mrs sushma swaraj had some had started something important which is parishikshit jao surakshit jao go skilled and go safe and i think we really need to uh, to expand upon that and develop that i will um, leave it at that uh, and 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 say what a pleasure it's been to uh, speak with uh, uh, all of you and it's been a good learning for me as well uh, and let me hand the floor back to dr deepika thank you sir it's been it's been a great uh, discussion uh, thank you ambassador suri for sharing it so smoothly and all our panelists who joined from different parts of the country it's been great to have you 